talks, of course. The talks are concerned with uh, smooth analysis or online algorithms. And I think maybe in, a, in, in one or two cases, both. Uh, the first talk about prefix discrepancy is concerned with uh, improving uh, results of prior results about you know, prefix discrepancy in the, in the setting of smoothed analysis. And it also generalizes the problem from what could be regarded as a single path to, to, to DAGs and to, to set systems. The next talk is, is about a smooth analysis of uh, submodular maximization. And its kind of take home is that, is that greed is still good in that setting where the, the smoothing is with respect to the, the budget involved. Um, the greedy algorithm still works, but the approximation ratios can be in expected sense better than the usual one minus one over E. There is a talk about uh, multi-scale entropic regularization, which uh, it has achieved state-of-the-art uh, competitive ratio, but uh, does this by way of a, a, a novel embedding method, um, very different from previous ones used for metrical task systems, so has some, has some uh, future possibilities as well. Uh, there is a there is a paper about smooth analysis of polytope diameter, uh, where it uses distinct analysis methods involving uh, uh, spectral methods involving the spectrum of the of a certain het, uh, associated Hessian. It also has results about integer polytopes and uh, generalizes the diameter to question to about almost diameter, so between many pairs of, of vertices, I believe. And the final talk of the session is about uh, equ uh, relating two distinct online selection problems for matroids, the, the matroid secretary problem and the contention resolution problem. And it, it completes the work of showing that they are equivalent. So our, our first talk is the, on prefix discrepancy. I, I hope our speaker is here. Yeah, I'm giving the talk. So. Okay, please share your screen and, and go ahead. Uh, I think you have to stop sharing. Oh, I'm, my apologies, okay. Okay. I think even not maximized, it's 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 perfectly readable. So. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to hit play, but uh, I'm not sure how to get rid of this. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. It's fine. Oh. Okay. All right. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, this talk will be about discrepancy theory. Uh, I'm Makran, and this is a joint work with Nikhil Mansal, Halti and Jiang, Raghu Mehta, and Sahit Sega. So the main problem that we will be looking at in this talk is uh, what's called the vector balancing problem. Uh, so let me introduce this now. Uh, here you are given vectors, V1 through Vt. So two vec uh, T vectors, uh, these are D-dimensional vectors, and they all have Euclidean norm at most one. And our goal is to balance these vectors in some way. So one of the most popular uh, questions about vector balancing is the so-called Komlos conjecture, uh, which says the following, that you can always assign signs to these vectors, either plus or minus, such that when you looked at the vector, uh, that is the uh, signed sum of all these vectors, meaning that you sum these vectors by assigning the corresponding sign, then each coordinate of the final uh, signed sum vector is uh, at most a constant. So the infinity norm of this final vector is a constant. So this is a very strong conjecture in discrepancy theory. Uh, it implies other popular conjectures like the beck fiala conjectures and other important results like Spencer's theorem. And this has been a longstanding open problem. And the best bound we know for this problem uh, is due to Banaschik, uh, who gave a bound of uh, square root log d plus square root log t this D is the dimension and T is the number of vectors. So this still uh, close, I mean, this is close to the constant bound, but still not exactly constant because it depends on the dimension and the number of vectors. And this is the best we know of. 
And this relies on some very nice convex geometric uh, methods, uh, this result. So this is the Kohn-Lipschitz conjecture. Uh, and this talk will be concerned with a variant of this problem that I will call the prefix discrepancy problem. So in the Kohn-Lipschitz conjecture, we only looked at the final sign sum, but here we care about all prefixes also. So if we stop at any point uh, and look at all the, uh, the sign sum of the vectors until that point, then we want to minimize the uh, infinity norm of all such vectors as well. So this is a prefix discrepancy problem. Uh, the best bound for this problem is the same as uh, for the Kohn-Lipschitz conjecture. It's due to Banaschek, uh, square root log d plus square root log t. So looking at the final sign sum or all prefixes, I mean, so far uh, it doesn't seem to make a difference in the bound. Uh, uh, and uh, this is what we're going to explore in the stock. And let me mention that this prefix discrepancy problem, this also is related to another very uh, classic problem in discrepancy theory called the Steinitz problem, which has various applications in integer programming and approximation algorithms. So in this talk, we'll look at, you know, what kind of uh, structure does uh, prefix discrepancy imposes on our bounds and, uh, you know, uh, what sort of uh, problems come because of it. Here are some motivating questions for the talk. First, one can ask, you know, is Panaschik's found optimal for the prefix discrepancy problem? If you look at all prefixes here, is the square root log D or square root log T necessary? Uh, because kohn lipschitz conjecture says that for the final sum, uh, is the bound is a constant. Secondly, I mean, uh, you can view the prefixes of one through T as just the prefixes of the path so you consider a graph, which is just a path graph on T vertices and prefix uh, discrepancy problem, you're looking at uh, prefixes of one through of this uh, path. But what if we consider prefixes of a general tree or a general bag? So now you want to uh, minimize the discrepancy over all, with all such constraints as well. Uh, I mean, how does this compare to Banaschek's bound? And lastly, I mean, one can study uh, the setting when the discrepancy constraints are coming from arbitrary set system S, not just prefixes of a graph or a tree. And we call this problem the combinatorial discrepancy problem. So these are the questions that we look at in this work. And uh, let me tell you what we prove about, uh, uh, we can say about these questions. So firstly, for uh, uh, the question about whether Banaschik's bound is optimal for prefix discrepancy problem, we show that this is not the case in a smooth analysis setting. So if you perturb these vectors by adding a small amount of noise and uh, the noise model uh, we can consider is, can be uh, uh, pretty general. So it covers a lot of different types of noises. Uh, all we need is that the covariance matrix uh, has a, a sufficiently large eigenvalue, which is one over polynomial in the dimension. Uh, and in this case, you can improve Banaschik's bound by a exponential factor in, in the parameter t. So the bound becomes root log log t in this parameter with high probability. So if the number of vectors is exponential, even uh, we get the same bound uh, as this, this bound here. And uh, I mean, let me also mention that this bound uh, is uh, in the smooth setting but that we prove is also tied, assuming that this bound is tied in the worst case. So if Panaschik's bound is tied in, in the worst case, then even for a random, completely random instance, uh, our bound cannot be improved for prefix discrepancy. So this is the first result. And what if we consider prefixes of a tree or a DAG? I mean, how does the situation change? So in this case, if you look at prefixes of a tree, uh, we can still show that Banaschik's bound still hold in this setting. Uh, root log t plus root log t, but in this setting, it cannot be improved. And more generally, if you consider any DAG, then you have to compare the discrepancy with respect to another parameter called the hereditary discrepancy, which I'm not going to define here, but the discrepancy uh, with respect to any prefixes of a DAG can be bounded in terms of the hereditary discrepancy of the set systems times this root log t, uh, d plus root log t factor. And for uh, uh, a tree or, a, or the line, this factor hereditary discrepancy is always bounded by constant. So uh, we recover Banaschik's bound here. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, for a tree or a DAG, this upper bound is tight. 
uh, even for a random instance, uh, this bound is always achieved. So this setting differs from uh, the setting of a path or a line, uh, which is quite interesting. And lastly, if you look at any arbitrary set system, uh, in this case, uh, the discrepancy, uh, we can show that discrepancy is still bounded by the, in terms of the hereditary discrepancy of the underlying set system. They have some polylog factors, uh, but here the polylog factor also depends on the size of the set system, which can be pretty large. So these are our results. And uh, let me just conclude with uh, some open problems uh, uh, that follow from this line of work. Uh, the first question is, you know, one can wonder about a strong version of Komlosh conjecture, which asks whether, you know, there always exists sign so that all prefixes have constant discrepancy. As far as we know, this could be true. Uh, and this implies the Komlosh conjecture, but maybe it's easier to prove lower bounds for, for this problem because you, it's a strictly harder problem. Uh, secondly, you know, Komlosh or Beck-Fiala conjectures are long-standing open problems in the field. Uh, and uh, to make progress on them, uh, recently, a lot of work has gone into studying random instances uh, for these conjectures. But uh, one can also try to understand what happens in a smooth analysis setting. Do these conjectures hold uh, in some reasonable noise model or not? And that also tells you something about uh, the lower bound instances for these problems. Uh, it says that the, if, the conjecture holds in a smooth setting, then such instant inst instances must be quite rigid because they, it does not hold for, uh, if you allow a tiny bit of noise in the model. Uh, so this is another very interesting direction uh, to pursue. And lastly, uh, uh, the third uh, question is sort of related to this combinatorial discrepancy problem, where our bounds are polylog factors and also depend on the cardinality of the set system. And uh, one can wonder if we can assume, uh, achieve bounds similar to what we achieve for DAGs here or a general set system. And lastly, there's always a very interesting question of making these results algorithmic. So let me mention that we can essentially make all of our results algorithmic uh, if we uh, lose an extra log D or log D factor, but uh, achieving the optimal bound with an algorithm, uh, it remains a very interesting problem as well. So uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so any, any questions from the, uh, the panelists or uh, I guess for, and attendees would raise their hands and, uh, and uh, we would allow them to, to, to speak. Okay, I guess we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Thanks very much. Um, uh, uh, Junyao, you wanna, you wanna show your screen? Yeah, sure. Can you see the slides? Okay, um, so uh, hello everyone. My name is Junyao. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Stanford University. Today, I'm going to tell you about budget smooth analysis of the modular maximization. This is joint work with my advisor, Avada Winston. Let me introduce the problem set up using a motivating application. Suppose we are getting our friends to vote, but we are so busy, so we only have time to remind the care of our friends to vote and they'll remind their friends to vote, and their friends, and so on. This problem is called influence diffusion, and uh, the objective can be modeled as a monotonous modular function. Here, monoton means more of your friends you remind, more people will vote in the end. The so modular means the same person cannot vote twice, even if two of their friends remind them. The modular functions have a lot of applications in econ and machine learning. 
Specifically, the modular maximization problem asks us to choose an optimal subset of k elements that maximizes the submodular function. The cardinality constraint k is sometimes also called a budget. This problem is solved decades ago. Specifically, there is a greedy algorithm that achieves the 1 minus 1 over e approximation ratio. And there is a matching hardness result that says, uh, in order, it is impossible to beat 1 minus 1 over e using efficient algorithms. More recent research focuses on designing streaming parallel, robust, or faster algorithms that also get a 1 minus 1 over e approximation. So what about the missing one over E? The point is one minus one over E is just a worst case guarantee. And in practice, people observe greedy does much better. How much better? The answer depends on the application or the instance. However, there is a recent work that shows how many realistic instances greedy achieves 80% to 99% approximation ratio. Therefore, a very nice open problem in this area is why greedy does better in practice and what makes practical instances easier. Can we do even better than greedy in practice? Uh, we are not the first people who study these questions. There are many previous work try to model beyond the worst case modular functions. However, um, these proposals, they suffer from two kinds of issues. Either they are too strong and intractable to verify in practice, or they are too weak, so they cannot beat 1 minus 1 over e. So in summary, we have a lot of great ideas, but we still don't know what is a nice modular function. Therefore, we, are, we have a beyond the worst case dilemma. On the one hand, we want performance, we want to explain the missing one over E, or at least a fraction of it. On the other hand, we want robustness. We want our model to apply widely to practical instances, and we want the assumption to be easy to verify in practice. Our approach to resolve this dilemma is starting from an overlooked object. Recall that our um, the submodular maximization problem has two objects, the function f and the budget k. So our observation is that independent of modeling beyond worst case submodular functions, we can also model average case behavior of the budget. And uh, this approach is motivated by both practice and the theory. And it allows us to get both performance and robustness. So in the longer uh, video, I give more detailed explanation and examples of this, but now uh, let me just uh, jump right into the model for the interest of time. So our model is called budget smooth analysis. We first fix a budget distribution. For example, the budget distribution of the 2000 demo, uh, 2020 Democrats candidates campaign. Then the adversary picks a single worst case modular function. Arguably, all the candidates are optimizing roughly the same function. For example, they might be doing influence maximization over the same social network, like Facebook or YouTube. But as you can see, they have very different budgets. Then we sample a random budget from the distribution, and we run the algorithm on the instance given by the function f and the budget k. Our analysis show, shows greedy guarantees that average candidate's campaign was 67% optimal. Let me do this one more time, but a bit more formally. We first fix a budget distribution D, then adversary picks a single worst case module function F. Then we sample a random budget K from the distribution and run the algorithm on the instance of F and K. The performance measure is the expected approximation ratio, where the expectation is taken over the um, budget distribution. And we show greedy guarantees average candidates campaign was 67% optimal. By simple Ar Markov argument, this shows most candidates should do better than one minus one over E. 
We call our desired rata. We want robustness. Our model makes no assumption on functions, and the noise model is arguably very simple. And uh, in practice, in practice, we can simply verify the assumption about the budget distribution by just uh, calculating the empirical distribution of the budgets. What about performance? We explained the four percent out of missing thirty-seven percent, and our model requires larger perturbations. So this is good, but there's room for future work. For example, one can combine our budget smooth analysis model with the model that makes assumption about functions to get an even better approximation ratio. Now let me state our main results. First, uh, we show that in the budget smooth analysis model, greedy algorithm is still optimal for every budget distribution. This result extends to other greedy type algorithms in map reduce and parallel settings. We find this result quite surprising because greedy algorithm is independent of budget. In the other words, greedy automatically adjusts itself according to the budget distribution in an optimal way. Besides, we derive a simple uh, but non-convex program that computes expected approximation ratio in the budget smooth analysis model. And we observe better than one minus one over E approximation by solving this program for many realistic budget distributions. Finally, we prove a robust hardness result that says no budget distribution allows better than 90% approximation in expectation. So um, finally, um, I have another, I want to give another takeaway. That is, um, I, I believe budget smooth analysis is interesting and should be applied to other budget constraint optimization problems. Because um, I think budget smooth analysis provides a trackable beyond the worst case performance test for the worst case optimal algorithms. If the Worst case our optimal algorithm passes the test, namely it is still optimal in the budget smooth analysis model. Then this gives rigorous evidence that the algorithm um, probably has, bad, uh, has good average case performance. If the, uh, if the algorithm fails the test, then by designing budget smooth analysis, uh, budget smooth optimal algorithm, uh, we might find better worst case optimal algorithm that performs better in practice. So in the uploaded video, I give um, more explanation and examples of, of this point. So here for the interest of time, uh, let me just uh, stop here and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you. So are, are there any questions? Um, hi, I have a question. Yeah, sure. I was I was wondering um, what sort of aspects of a distribution make it uh, more, you know, make it possible to achieve a better approximation ratio. So is it like high variance distributions or what sort of heuristics? Yes, that's a very good question. So in general, we find, of course, uh, if your distribution is more spread. That is, it's supported on a wide, wide range. Then you could expect a better approximation ratio in uh, in expectation. Um, for example, uh, if you consider like exponential di uh, distribution on, on a larger range of budgets, then that could give you um, significantly better than one minus one over the approximation ratio. Okay. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? So, so, so I guess a natural question is uh, the possibility of a high probability bound or some, some something more than average case with respect to the budget distribution. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so first, just uh, if you have expectation, then by Markov inequality, you know you can say something uh, with high mm -hmm. probability with worse um, well, approximation ratio. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks very much. I guess uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go on to uh, uh, the next talk.
Can you review my good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Farzam, and today I'm going to talk about the metrical test systems problem on general metric spaces. And this is based on a joint work with James Lee. So first, let me define the problem to you. So imagine you're given a metric space, in this case, a path metric, and that we're standing at some point this metric. And over time, uh, a monster appears at some locations in this metric. And if it, if it appears at the location that we're standing on, we have to make a move either to the left or to the right. Otherwise, we can stay on it. And we would be paying a cost of the total distance that we have traveled. And the crucial thing is that we have to make decision, these decisions online without knowing what, what will happen in the future. And the goal is to remain competitive with respect to an optimal offline algorithm that knows the future. So more precisely, we say that, that an online algorithm is alpha competitive if for any fixed input sequence, the cost that this algorithm pays is upper bounded by alpha times the cost of the opt up to some additive constant factors. And this constant factor can depend on the metric, but it cannot depend on the time t that we're measuring onto. So it's not hard to see that if, we, if, if the algorithm is only allowed to make deterministic choices, that it, then it cannot do better than omega and competitiveness. But uh, in a random case, we can do much better. We can get it down to value log n. So what do I mean by that? Uh, we say that a randomized online algorithm is alpha competitive if its expected cost is upper bounded by alpha times the cost of opt. Uh, so let me define this problem in the more general setting. So we're given a metric, a metric x and dx. And over time, a sequence of cost vectors CT uh, arrive over time, and these vectors are non-negative. And we must respond to the CT with a possibly random XT in X. And uh, we would be paying a total cost of uh, a sum over these movement costs, which is what I suggested earlier, and as well as the service cost, which at time t would be the entry of this vector ct at the point xt, which we are playing with that. And uh, equivalently, we can define this problem as if the algorithm is uh, playing deterministically, but it's, it's allowed to uh, play fractionally. So it's allowed to choose some point mu t in the probability simplex over the points of this metric x, and then the service cost can be written as this inner product of CT and mu T. And the movement cost uh, can be rephrased as uh, this earth mover distance between mu T minus one and mu T. And the goal is to minimize this. And this problem has been introduced by in 92 by the work of Borodin, Lionel, and Sachs, and is one of the central open problems in the area of uh, online algorithms. So it is conjectured that we should be able to obtain a logging competitive algorithm for any metric space. And in fact, for some special families of metrics, uh, a log inbound both, both as an upper bound and as a lower bound has been obtained. But for general metric spaces, after a long line of work, the best upper bound that we know is log squared of n, and the best lower bound is log n or log log n. So our focus in this talk would be on the side of upper bounds. Uh, so let's see how these upper bounds are obtained. Uh, first, let's focus on a rather simpler metric, which is the weighted stars. So uh, this metric is essentially the shortest path metric between the leaves of a weighted star graph. So here, the distance in uh, this V1 and V2 is W1 plus W2. And uh, so in response to a cost vector CT, 
what kind of makes sense is that we have we should kind of reduce the amount of mass that we're playing at points that uh, we are seeing more cost at. Uh, but when we do that, we have to redistribute this mass to the other points in the metric. Otherwise, we'll, we're leaving this uh, probability in place. So, uh, so the idea is to just project this uh, mu t minus eta times c t back to the convex set. Kx, and this eta is just some learning rate, uh, which which would be constant over the one of the algorithm. And the main question is, how do we do this redistribution or this projection? Uh, the first guess might be to do this with Euclidean uh, distance, and then it would correspond to doing a projected gradient descent. But it turns out that this wouldn't work. But if instead we were doing uh, uh, this projection with the uh, Bregman divergence of some regularizer phi, then this algorithm would correspond to mere descent, which is well studied in the study of convex uh, optimization. And turns out that we, we could get a logging competitive algorithm. So, uh, so of course, it would depend on uh, what phi we need to choose. And it turns out that if we choose phi to be this uh, weighted entropy function uh, or something similar to that, you would obtain a logging competitive algorithm. So the main crucial thing about this uh, mirror descent framework is that it, it kind of allows us to bound the service cost of our algorithm uh, with the total cost of the optimal algorithm in a very convenient way. And in the, especially in the early work on this problem, this has been kind of the hardest part of uh, the analysis. But now we kind of get this uh, part for free, uh, but the catch is that we don't necessarily have a bound on our movement cost. And for that, we have to take a more uh, clever regularizer phi. Uh, so let's switch to a more general family of metrics, uh, which are called hierarchically separated trees or HSTs for short. So these metrics are just uh, the shortest path metrics on the leaves of a rooted uh, weighted uh, tree in which the weight of the edges goes down, go down geometrically along uh, root leaf paths. And because of this geometric decay, we can see that the, the length of the shortest path between two points is essentially dominated by the largest edge in that path. And the interesting fact about HSCs is that up to a factor of log n, they can essentially approximate all metrics. So uh, I'm not going to explain this formally, but but the main takeaway is that if we can get a get an alpha competitive algorithm for HSC metrics, it will automatically imply that there's an alpha times log n competitive algorithm for any metric. And in fact, that's how uh, the case of general metrics was handled in the prior work, in the work of Bubek, uh, Cohen, Lee, and Lee, in the work of Koester and Lee. What they did was they first provided a logging competitive algorithm for uh, MTS on HSTs, and then it would imply that uh, there's a log and squared competitive algorithm for all metrics. Uh, and this was done via mirror descent, as you might have guessed. So um, instead of uh, doing mirror descent on directly on the probability simplex over the points of the metric, we have to do it on a sort of lift of this uh, probability simplex. And uh, more precisely, we would be representing this probability distribu distribution as a unit flow from uh, the root of this tree to, its, to the set of its leaves. And then if we define the regularizer as a sort of multi-scale uh, conditional entropy function, then it turns out that we get a logging competitive algorithm. But, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, the conjecture is that the correct bound for this problem is 
log n, and it seems that this extra log n factor that, that we're paying because of this reduction is unnecessary. And it was asked by Kubek whether we can get the, rid of this reduction at least, and, and can we at least get the same polylogarithmic bonds that, as before, but directly while they're directly using mere descent. Uh, two, two now, minutes, two minutes. Yeah, sure. Two minutes, okay, thanks. And uh, our main result is to show that uh, we can actually do this. Uh, we show that uh, essentially we can run mere descent uh, on a DAG constructed on top of these HST matrix, uh, sorry, a given metric and obtain a log n squared combative algorithm. So I'm not going to get into the details of that, but essentially given a metric, we construct a DAG on top of it and define a regularizer similar to what we had for HSTs. And we show that uh, this algorithm would be log n squared competitive as long as some properties are, are satisfied uh, for this DAG. And, uh, as for open problems, so we haven't uh, essentially improved the upper bound of this problem, but we have kind of made a conceptual progress in this problem. And uh, I think uh, it is possible to build up on these ideas to improve, improve on the log in squared bound. Uh, and this is still open even for the path metric. And the lower bound is also for a log log n factor far from the conjectured bound. And if we can prove a lower one for HST metrics, it would imply a lower one for all metrics. So yeah, that's it. Okay, thanks very much. Um, maybe a quick question. Okay, why don't, why don't we go on to, uh, to the next talk? Thank you, thanks very much. All right, um, hello everyone. Looks good. Okay, great. Um, okay, so this talk is on a uh, structural approach to uh, polytope diameter. So first I'm just gonna give a brief history of the problem, then describe the uh, the results from the spectral graph theory that we use, and then go into how to apply those results in the context of this convex geometry problem. Um, so in this talk, uh, a polytope, uh, all the polytopes we discuss will be living in D dimensions, that's sort of the ambient space, and all polytopes will have M constraints. Um, and uh, given a polytope, we define a point on the, on the boundary of the polytope to be a vertex if D of the constraints are tight. And similarly, a line segment is an edge if D minus one constraints are tight. Now, the vertices and edges of a polytope uh, correspond very naturally to the vertices and edges of an associated connected graph. Um, and drawn in orange here is an example for the Q. The vertices and edges form uh, a graph here. The question that we ask is, what is the diameter of this graph? Um, this is motivated by uh, linear programming, where a lot of linear programming algorithms work by picking the vertex of, the poly of some polytope of feasible solutions then following this graph or following some path along this graph to an optimal vertex for some definition of optimal. Um, and it would be nice to know that all these paths are short. Um, uh, so a trivial bound is just an upper bound of the total number of vertices, which is M choose D, but this is exponential in D, it's, it's not uh, desirable at all. Uh, so the goal is to do much better and indeed um, that's what this is towards. So an old conjecture from the 1950s is that the diameter of this graph is upper bounded by M minus D. So M is the number of constraints and D is the ambient dimension. And there are two results that I first wanna highlight about this. Uh, the first is that it's upper bounded by M minus D to log D. So it's still a far away, away from the Hirsch conjecture. And um, the second result is actually disproving the specific Hirsch conjecture. So uh, there's a construction due to Santos that shows the diameter is actually at least M for a certain class of polytopes. So the updated conjecture that we are now working towards is, is the diameter bounded just by some polynomial in M and D? So it's not gonna be M minus D, but is it some polynomial? Now this, this has proven to be quite difficult to prove. 
So instead, we have focused, and the literature has focused on a slightly easier variant, which allows, which allows us one additional parameter, which is the max determinant of any submatrix of the constraint matrix. So in this setting, we instead take the polytope, the constraint matrix have all integer entries, and we let delta be the max determinant. Um, and we allow the diameter to depend the polynomial in MD and delta. So the first result uh, is that if delta is one, i.e. this matrix is unimodular, then the Hirsch conjecture is true, that it is a polynomial in MD. Um, and in general, uh, for, for a general delta, the bound uh, that's known previous to this work is, is D cubed delta squared. Um, the problem, of course, is that delta could be exponential in, um, uh, in D and M. So this does not prove the curve conjecture um, uh, has this extra parameter there. So now our result improves this, um, uh, or in some setting of these parameters, improves it to the case of uh, D squared delta squared log M delta. So the result from the spectral graph theory is a conversion from a spectral gap of a generalized adjacency matrix into a diameter. So if you take an adjacency matrix, but then let all the non-zero entries be anything or any positive value as opposed to one, then you get in a generalized adjacency matrix. And for generalized adjacency matrices, uh, a spectral gap turns into a bound of the diameter. So in green, I have a picture of what the eigenvalues might look like. So if you have all the eigenvalues in between the interval minus one to one, but then one eigenvalue, the top one, separated away from the rest by gamma, you can turn this into a bound of diameter. And the proof is pretty straightforward. You just apply a degree K Chebyshev polynomial to this matrix S, then the non-zero entries of that matrix uh, will correspond to the existence of paths of length at most K. Um, but when you apply this polynomial, it blows up the rank one matrix corresponding to the top eigenvalue and suppresses the rest. So if the degree is high enough, uh, this, this matrix uh, T of S will be approximately rank one and all the entries will be positive. So the two key parameters in this result are the value of the smallest entry in the corresponding eigenvector, um, because in the rank one matrix, you need all the entries to be positive. So you need all the entries in the eigenvector to be positive and also the size of the gap. We want the size of the gap to spectral gap to be large. So those are the two key parameters that we need to do. Let me just uh, zoom past the uh, proof of the statement. I sort of explained it in words. Um, so we first though need to define what the generalized adjacency matrix we use is gonna be. So we need to construct what, what adjacency matrix, the adjacency matrix is. Uh, and to do that, we need to introduce this notion of a polar of a polytope. So if you're given a polytope, you can think about the uh, constraints as a collection of vectors. Um, uh, those are the rows of A. Now the polar of the polytope is simply the convex hull of those constraint vectors, uh, appropriately normalized. Now, the nice thing about pol uh, the polar of a polytope is that the facets of an original polytope correspond to vertices and the vertices of the original correspond to facets. So here I have a little example of a cube corresponding to an octahedron. So the, the six faces of the cube become the six vertices of the octahedron and the eight vertices of the cube become the eight facets of the octahedron. And now the graph, uh, which was formerly the edge vertex graph, of the original polytope corresponds to the facet incidence graph of the polar. So the facets are now our nodes and the edges connecting nodes are the intersections between two adjacent facets. So the goal is to bound the diameter of the facet incident graph of the polar polytope. So the key idea is to note that the polar polytope itself, because it's a polytope, it can be naturally written as a convex hull in terms of the problem description, but it can also be written as mx less than c for some other constraint matrix m uh, in vector c. And the key idea here is to consider this, the volume of this polytope as a function of those slack variables, the C vectors. So MX less than C as a function of C, what is the volume of the polytope? Um, our first claim is that this Hessian, the Hessian of this volume function is a generalized adjacency matrix. And the second claim is that it has exactly one positive eigenvalue. So first let's look at the first claim that it's a generalized adjacency matrix. Uh, we'll sort of just do a proof by picture the partial derivative of the volume with respect to one of the slack variables is just the volume of the corresponding facet. And to see that, you can see in this, this diagram on the side, the orange line is the volume of the new facet after uh, I prefer is the, um, the difference between the blue and parallel blue and uh, orange lines is the change in the volume as I perturb C sub i by a small amount. So it's just the volume of that facet. 
And now the second derivative, I want to know how quickly does the, or what's the rate at which the volume of one facet changes as I change the slack variable corresponding to a different facet. Um, and you can see that that value will only be non-zero if these facets intersect. If the facet fi and fj don't intersect, then changing c sub j has no effect on the volume of, of f sub i and vice versa. So only when these two in things intersect do we get a non-zero value, which is exactly what we need in order for this to be an adjacency matrix. Okay. So the second claim that it has exactly one positive eigenvalue, this comes from noting the nature of the diagonal entries, or sorry, excuse me, uh, this comes from noting that the log of, of, of the Hessian, or sorry, the log of the volume is a concave function. This is not a trivial, this is not a trivial fact to see, um, but it's, it's a prior result that's known. Um, and it's true for general, and it's true as a fact of general log concave functions, uh, their Hessians um, have exactly one positive eigenvalue. Um, so we use this log concavity result. Okay, so simply saying that one of the eigenvalues is positive is not enough. For our result, we need to show that the, actually there's a spectral gap, right? That that one eigenvalue is far away from the other eigenvalues. And to, to uh, show that, we notice a relationship between the Hessian and a particular Laplacian. So it turns out that the diagonal entries of this Hessian um, are, are almost like a Laplacian, except they're all too small in order for uh, uh, the Hessian to be a Laplacian. So in other words, we can write the Hessian as minus a Laplacian plus a strictly positive matrix. Um, and that is what allows us to um, get a spectral gap. So multiply each side by d to the one half, then the left-hand side has exactly one positive eigenvalue just by Sylvester's inertial law. And the right-hand side is a negative semi-definite matrix plus the identity. Uh, so we know that this matrix has a spectral gap of at least one. So it's not just that it has one positive eigenvalue, we know that it's, it's far away from the other eigenvalue, so that leaves one away. Um, okay, so we also know what the eigenvector is. Uh, the corresponding eigenvector is just the square root of all the diagonal entries corresponding to D. And we, we can shift all these eigenvalues up. So some of these eigenvalues might be very negative, but you shift them all up and uh, do an appropriate uh, linear combination of this matrix with the identity, and you wind up with uh, a matrix which is exactly the one we want in the setting of our theorem, where all the eigenvalues are in between minus one, except for one, which is gamma. And just using a little bit of trigonometry, you can show that this, that this gamma is the square of the sine of the smallest angle between any of these two facets. And that sort of then just directly corresponds to uh, the results in the paper using that, um, uh, using a relationship between the max debt of these submatrices and the angle gives the uh, stated result. Um, so the last thing, uh, okay, so, so this is a summary of the, of the main steps. Now, the results from smooth analysis, I don't have time to go into, but you can check the paper, essentially shows that if you do a small perturbation of this polytope, let me go back slide, a small perturbation of this polytope, then this theta, the, the angle between facets, becomes good for most of pairs of facets. So we are able to show that um, in the smooth setting, uh, you, we remove the, the dependence on delta squared, and we show that there exists a large component, in other words, a, a subgraph, of at least 99% of the vertices of the original graph, which has polynomial diameter. Um, but of course, we're not able to extend that to the entire graph, it's just for a large component. Um, okay, so that is the result. Um, and yeah, some open questions are just essentially, can we improve any of the steps in this, in this work? Um, and uh, so that's it. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. So, so do we have any questions? Uh, just very quick. Uh, we'll hold off then, I guess, and uh, and go to the last talk of this session. Uh, All right. We could. There we yes. are. Can you see my slides? Yes. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? I, I can. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So uh, my name is Shad. I'm going to tell you about how the matroid secretary problem is equivalent to contention resolution. So uh, my main result is the following. I show that uh, two statements are equivalent. The first one is the matroid secretary conjecture, which says that there's a constant competitive algorithm uh, for the matroid secretary problem. 
The second statement concerns contention resolution on matroids, and it says that contention resolution there is approximately as powerful in the random order model as it is in the offline model. And this should hold for all correlated distributions, not just for product distributions. So uh, why is this interesting? Um, let me uh, try and convince you that it's uh, useful to know this. Um, first, it tells us that the matrix secretary problem, even though it features these adversarial weights, is actually equivalent to a natural stochastic problem, in particular, the contention resolution problem. It also suggests that um, online contention resolution in the presence of positive correlation is actually the core challenge of matrix secretary, because the second bullet is known for product distributions and also for negatively correlated distributions for a suitable definition. And this connection to contention resolution hopefully opens the door for a lot of the recent progress on contention resolution to be applied to the matrix secretary conjecture. And finally, um, this tells us that the hard part of the matrix secretary problem, even though the problem features these uh, cardinal weights, the hard part only uses ordinal information about those weights. Uh, so let me rephrase the second bullet in a form that's a little bit more convenient. Uh, so I say that every matroid admits what I call a universal random order contention resolution scheme. What do I mean by universal? Uh, let me tell you. First, I'm going to say a distribution over subsets of the elements of the matroid is alpha uncontentious if it allows alpha balanced co uh, contention resolution offline. So this is where you select each active element with probability alpha times the probability that it shows up. Okay. Uh, and I say a contention resolution scheme is universal if Whenever you give it a uh, alpha balance, uh, an alpha uncontentious distribution, it achieves a C times alpha balance. So it matches the best possible offline up to a uh, universal constant factor of C. Okay. So um, this is not a restatement of the previous uh, form of the statement. Um, and it turns out that I need, I only need even a, a weaker form of that uh, second bullet. Uh, I only require you to do uh, well for a single uh, fixed alpha. So here I say there exists an alpha and a beta such that every matroid admits a beta alpha universal uh, random order contention resolution scheme, which says that you achieve a beta balance for every uh, alpha uncontentious distribution. And this should hold only for a single alpha. So what happens is that the matrix secretary conjecture implies the strong form uh, of contention of universal contention resolution in the second bullet. The, sec uh, the strong form obviously implies the weak form. And then all you need is the weak form to establish the uh, matroid secretary conjecture. So um, this result builds on my previous work in ICAL from two years ago. There I proved uh, the forward direction, which is the matroid secretary conjecture implies universal contention resolution. Um, and there I proved a weak uh, form, a weak converse, uh, which says that beta alpha universal uh, random order contention resolution in a restrictive model of contention resolution, which may or may not be realistic, implies the matroid secretary conjecture. So this is a weak converse uh, here. So in this paper, I remove the restriction and basically strengthen the second direction to prove full equivalent of the uh, full, full equivalence of these uh, three statements. So I'm going to note that this result is information uh, theoretic, and I don't get into whether or not any of these reductions can be made computationally efficient. So uh, this is the picture. Uh, this is the picture of the reductions. So I want you to think of these arrows in the algorithmic sense. So the arrow from the top to the bottom says you use an algorithm for matrix secretary to solve universal contention resolution. So this direction uh, was the easier direction. It was shown in my ICAL paper from two years ago and uses the observation that matroid secretary just essentially solves a dual of contention resolution. So in this paper, I prove the opposite. I, I use the universal contention resolution scheme in the random order model to prove the matroid secretary conjecture. So, um, uh, so the approach uh, looks somewhat familiar uh, for anybody who's worked on matrix secretary algorithms. First, you sample roughly half the elements as they show up online, and then you uh, try and resolve contention for the improving elements. And those are the elements that improve the offline optimum on the sample. So you try and select a subset of those, and you want to select each of them with constant probability. That's what contention resolution would guarantee. So um, here's a first stab at that. Uh, so uh, from my previous paper, uh, we know that improving elements, even though they feature positive correlation, are actually uncontentious, again, in the offline sense. And uh, it's easy to see that they're worth uh, a constant fraction of the optimum value. So if you apply universal contention resolution to the improving elements, uh, you, sh uh, you should be able to recover a uh, constant fraction of the optimum value. But there's a major problem with this approach. 
um, in, and it's the following. Uh, in contention resolution, we require the distribution of uh, inputs that is given up front, it's known a priori, but here we don't know it because the improving element distribution depends on the unknown adversarial weights. So this in this paper, the first thing we do is we solve this difficulty by first reducing the matroid secretary problem uh, to the matroid profit secretary problem. Um, and the matroid profit secretary problem is just the version of the matroid secretary problem where, you're given, where the uh, weights are drawn from a known prior. And here I allow the prior to have arbitrary correlation. And this reduction is pretty simple. It's just duality. Um, and now uh, this reduction buys us something. When the weight vector is uh, stochastic, now we know the distribution of weights. So therefore we know the distribution of improving elements and we can initialize a contention resolution scheme with that distribution and apply the same approach I outlined earlier. So this seems like it solved the problem we had before, but unfortunately it introduces another problem when the weights are uh, stochastic, they're random and they're correlated. Um, now, uh, contention resolution no longer uh, guarantees an approximation factor, because even though you might select each improving element with constant probability, um, the, uh, the, the selection events may be imbalanced with respect to the possible weights the element may have. So maybe you select an element half the time, but you only select it when its weight is small rather than when its weight is large. So you can't guarantee that you recover a constant fraction of the contribution of the weights. Um, so um, we show that this problem actually is a real problem. There's examples where this shows up. Um, so we have to kind of do something here to solve this uh, problem we introduced. Um, so what I do is I basically define a stronger form of contention resolution called labeled contention resolution, where I label each element with its weight and I require a stronger notion of balance with respect to element label pairs. So I didn't really do anything interesting here yet. Uh, basically, I just kicked the can down the road. I defined a more difficult problem, a uh, more difficult uh, version of contention resolution and asked you to solve that. But it uh, uh, turns out that this is the right definition. Um, so finally, in the last step, I reduced labeled to unlabeled contention resolution online. So uh, this is easy to see how th that this is possible in the offline setting because you can cheat because you can treat each element labeled pair as a parallel copy of the element. But it turns out this is highly non-trivial online. And uh, we uh, show that nevertheless, you can do it um, in the random order model. Um, and the, and um, this is where a lot of the technical uh, work in the paper goes. And for more detail, I refer you to the paper and the uh, longer talk. So this is the picture we end up with. And we conclude that all these four problems are equivalent up to constant factors. So to conclude, uh, I showed that the matroid secretary problem is equivalent to online contention resolution in the random order model for these uncontentious distributions. And this is interesting because um, uh, the contention resolution problem we get is, is obviously stochastic in nature and ordinal in nature. Um, now, the contention resolution uh, problem we reduced to uh, is challenging because it features positive correlation in the input set. Uh, however, this positive correlation is not arbitrary. It seems somewhat benign. In particular, in my original paper, I have a, a, a polyhedral characterization uh, of uncontentious distributions. And um, hopefully, if we can use this characterization to help in online contention resolution, then that might help resolve the matroid secretary conjecture. And that's all I have. Thanks. Thanks very Thank much. Uh, I think I think there I might be time for a quick, quick question. question. Mm -hmm. Or not, but I, I think I think we'll uh, conclude there. We're, we're just about exactly on time. So, so uh, thank, thanks very much. That's, that's the end of this uh, session.